Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is uh, Safir. I'll give a, a small um, presentation, a little bit about personal finance and things that you should consider. Uh, it's based on a guide that I have on a website called muslim.finance. You can look it up after too. It's, it's a very simple one page guide which has some basic stuff to, to get started with your personal finances. Uh, there's just some brief slides that I have, probably about 10 to 15, and then we can have a Q&A as well. Um, I think the first thing that people get typically wrong a lot about investing is that most of the time, maybe about 20 to 30 percent of the actual investment decision making process has to do with the things that you invest in, and much more of it has to do with the time horizon that you make. Uh, the longer that you are invested in something, um, especially something like passive, what they call, like investing in an index or a mutual fund, which is you're not actively managing it, the better. Um, because there's always ups and downs. And so it's very important to, everybody talks about think long term, think long term, think long term. But in order to actually do it effectively, you have to actually um, make less decisions and let things kind of just ride on, basically. So there's five or six like, key principles I have to, what I like to call financial peace. Uh, the first thing is obviously decide a budget. I'm sure many of you have probably already thought about doing that. Um, the second thing is to at least be saving 10% uh, every month. The third thing is if you have debt, it's to prioritize eliminating debt versus investing. I'm purely just talking about from a financial perspective of generally, um, if you have a dollar in terms of investing versus saving, you know, you might have an interest rate of like four or five percent. It's always going to be generally beneficial to pay off that debt versus investing in something else. Um, it's also important if you are employed somewhere that offers a 401k, a lot of these 401ks offer matching programs typically between two and four percent. So it's almost mandated by um, certain states. So at the very least, I would recommend to take advantage of that basic matching program. Um, the fifth thing is to set goals on what you need. You know, if you're trying to save up for a house, or you're trying to save up for a car, um, define actually what those particular goals are. And I'll show you kind of how to do that. And then the, the sixth thing is to actually invest about 10% of your salary uh, every month. A lot of people have trouble with figuring out how to actually save, like practically and in reality. So the simplest way that I've found is to just open a second checking account. And if you're getting some, let's say you're getting $1,000 every month as salary, you put, um, you define a budget, let's say your budget was $800, you have $800 going to one checking account, then you make a second checking account, and you put the remaining $200 there. And you kind of forget about the second account. The reason why I recommend putting it into a checking account versus a savings account is because savings accounts are generally interest bearing and they also have heavy restrictions on how much that you can transfer in and out of the account. Typically, it'll, they'll allow like three or four transfers. So just to make it easy on yourself, the best thing to do is to just open up a second checking account and pay all of your bills, your expenses, everything from the first account. So if you ever go, if you ever think that you're gonna go negative in that account, just basically borrow from the second account. It just forces you to have a process for basically saving, right? That's, that's kind of the goal to do. So this is just like a concrete example. If you're making $4,000 a month, put $3,000 in the main account, in the second account, put secondary. That can go eventually to savings that you want to do, you know, goals that you may have, or, or future investments. Okay, the, for the investing part, this is the part that everyone gets more excited or interesting about. The first thing I think is, you know, as Muslims, it's to decide your Islamic principles and stick with them. Sometimes you're presented with lots of opportunities that might be gray area or um, whatever, and you want to make sure that whatever principles that you think that you define, whether it's trying to avoid interest, whether it's avoiding to you know, buy stocks that are associated with gambling or 
um, military contractors or whatever, you, you try to keep that out. Second thing is keep it simple and to what you know. I know it seems counterintuitive, but um, literally like the best investments that you can probably make are just to buy like an index or like an ETF or like an amount of mutual funds in the stock market. Those will perform much higher than any real estate, any venture capital, any private equity investments that, you, that anybody does. And I've invested in across several of these and I can tell you that generally it's the most effective investment is the stock market and it's liquid. So if you need it at any time, you can basically withdraw it. Um, the third thing, we kind of mentioned it before, it's long term rather than short term. It's easy to say, hard to practice. Uh, the fourth thing is passive versus active. So it's better to invest in indexes where you can just be passive about it rather than trading buying this stock and selling this stock and buying another stock and stuff like that. Generally, like it's, it's proven in history that any uh, passive investors perform better than active investors. And the fifth thing that I recommend is to just automate it every month. So I, I just have like a weekly automated thing that basically buys like 150 bucks every week in the market through like an index. Um, and so it forces you, it's not like you have, you're thinking about it this week that I'm gonna invest in something or you're watching the market that this particular thing happened and I'm buying. The best thing to do is you cannot time the market. Nobody can. And the best thing to do is just to buy it every week, right? So that if there's peaks and valleys, you'll be able to capture them at any time. Uh, so this guy, this guy Morgan Housel, he has a book called The Psychology of Money. It's one of the few books that I actually recommend to read in investing. He had, he had this tweet which basically says just like shut up and wait. Because if you look at it from like the past like 40 years, or I don't know what this graph is from, uh, I think it's like 30 or 40 years, you can just see that it just, especially like, especially you, we're blessed to be in the U.S., the U.S. stock market generally just kind of goes like this. And there's a whole lot of ups and downs in between. But if you just literally invest in an index and lock it up and probably never look at it again, you'll be much better off than keeping looking at it for, uh, kind of on a daily, daily basis. So a lot of people when they think about investing, they think about like, how can I get the highest returns? I wanna get like 15, I wanna get 20% of the returns. And inevitably, whenever people do that, they end up making lots of emotional decisions and mistakes. And I think the, the best thing that you can do is to really just create a strategy. And it's really simple. It's actually not as complicated as people kind of um, anticipate. This is another chart before I get into the strategy, which kind of shows, um, so Aman, I'm sure many of you have heard Amana mutual funds. This is, I think, for the last, since 2006. So it's almost like 20 years. So um, the comparison chart I didn't use, I didn't have the actual dollar number, uh, percentage number, but that's probably around a thousand percent over the past 20 years. So that's like almost like a 50% annualized return, right? The point is like, who would not take a 50% return? The point is more often than not, it's just to invest in either a mutual fund or um, QQQ and XLK are tech focus indexes that I buy. Um, XLK is more sure it's about 96% compliant. So it meets the, you can't have more than 5% um, non-compliant in, in an index. So XLK generally meets that standard. Um, and these are, the, the reason why it's tech weighted is because generally tech stocks are more sure compliant than having banking stocks and, and stuff like that. There's some new ones that you guys might have heard called SPUS which is an index on uh, the S&P 500, and then HLAL, which is kind of across everything. They're kind of newcomers, but um, from my perspective, um, I generally recommend people to buy XLK or Amana. And then I also publish a filtered version of QQQ on my website, muslim.finance. So um, this is kind of like a guidelines matrix to kind of think about um, what you should be set in, like in terms of asset classes. And it doesn't really matter till I would say you have, I don't know, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars of savings. Um, 
But generally, your stocks, especially if you're doing like if you're following Sharia compliance, you're, you'll be mostly in tech stocks. So your returns will be you can expect probably anything in the range of like seven to ten percent. Although in the last like ten or twenty years, it's been closer to like fifteen to twenty percent. Um, in terms of like, if you look at any like standard investment portfolio, they'll typically have a, a section called fixed income. So you, you might have heard of this like bonds or treasury bills and stuff like that. Like every normal investment portfolio has this. But we as Muslims really don't have any options available uh, for this. Uh, the closest option today that basically exists is sukuk, uh, which is like, think of it as like bonds in Muslim countries, international markets. So like Saudi or, or Turkey will basically issue these Islamic quote unquote bonds. Um, they're actually generally not recommended. Like I, I work with a bunch of endowments and most of the endowments that I know are actually pulling out of Sukuk because it's highly volatile, um, not only in terms of price, but because the interest rates are fluctuating so much in the last couple of years, the, the price of Sukuk actually changes a lot. And there's a lot of international exposure. And again, we're blessed in the US to have a generally stable currency, most currency, like Turkey has, I think, a 60% inflation rate, right? So uh, generally, I don't recommend Sukuk, and I know many endowments that are actually replacing Sukuk with just low cash flow uh, real estate. Like I said, once you have like a couple hundred thousand dollars, then I think you can consider having some real estate component. And especially that's important because to kind of uh, replace the fixed income option that we kind of don't, don't have. Um, and then, an alternative, so you want, if you want to buy like gold or crypto, you can generally buy these things on the stock market. Uh, there's like a gold ETF called GLD. Uh, if you're buying Bitcoin, there's a Bitcoin ETF called IBIT that you can buy and then have some maintain some kind of cash. So the, the endowments I generally work with kind of follow the 20 year mark till they're about like the $10 million stage, $15 million stage. And then as they want to focus more on income, they'll start, kind of start to go in the, the right ones, right? So as you get older, you can't withstand, you know, the stock market is very volatile. You can't withstand a, um, a sudden drop in the stock market, right? So what you need to be doing is starting to shift your um, asset allocation to less, less stocks and more things like real estate or cash, um, basically. And this, this is like the guidelines that I have. If you go to like, look up like Schwab guidelines for asset allocation, it'll largely be the same. It'll just have bonds as a fixed income component and, it'll, and they generally don't talk about real estate. But because we don't have good options for fixed income, we're kind of forced, the, 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 the next closest thing basically is uh, cash flowing real estate. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this uh, later, but like lots, lots of like investment decisions really have to do with behavior rather than actually like buying something or the other. So the, the point that I talked about earlier about like automating it every week so you, you just set it and forget it. Um, I can tell you like I manage my active portfolio and then I have a portion that's automated and passive and the passive portfolio does better than the active portfolio. And I, I literally like study the markets for fun. So it's like, it's very, very hard to, very hard to beat. And the best in the world class uh, managers also generally cannot beat the market. It's very, very hard to beat the market. So the other thing I recommend for people to do is it's really not that hard to be strategic about it. So I would literally just open up like an Excel spreadsheet and write down all of the assets that you basically own, right? So if you have $100,000 of stocks, write that down. Um, if you have this much in 401k, write that down. If you have in real estate, write all that stuff, sum it all up, and then you know divide like 100k divided by the sum. So the sum here is like $200,000. So you have about 75% in stocks, 25% of that is in the in the 401k, and 50% is in the, in the regular brokerage account, right? When you structure it like this, when you see like these random opportunities for investing in this or you know buying this stock, 
you just always go back to this sheet and see basically how you should be positioned from an allocation perspective. And so this is, like, this is more like reality and then this is more what you should be kind of striving towards on the actual asset allocation. So this is the point I was saying earlier. Uh, we do not have a really good fixed income option. And it puts like our older community really at risk because if 90% of your assets are in the stock market and a crash happens, you will not be, you don't have the time horizon to basically recover. Um, and so um, that's why I really recommend to either go to cash or find alternative things basically like real estate to basically invest in. Um, so in terms of like home financing is like a very hot topic when it comes to personal finance. And I think MCC had a presentation with other home financing companies and I'm sure they'll do it again. Um, in terms of like buying a house, there's like multiple factors. There's not only finance factor. Actually, if I were to tell you, especially living in the Bay Area, like saving money in terms of buying a house is probably the least likely factor of why you should buy a house. It's more about like family and stability and stuff like that. Um, I recommend if you're considering buying a house or renting or whatever, uh, there's, a, there's a website called nerdwallet.com and just search nerdwallet rent versus buy calculator. And you can basically plug in like how much is your rent, uh, what type of home like you would be able to buy. Um, and it even factors in things like inflation, how much rent is expected to go up, how much um, house values are supposed to go up. And I guarantee you if you plug it in for like any house in the Bay Area or condo, it will almost be never cheaper to buy than rent, right? It'll almost, I know it's very counterintuitive advice that we hear, and it's always cheaper to buy versus renting. But if you do the math, it's honestly almost always cheaper to rent than buy. I'm not saying to not buy a house. I'm just saying that uh, there's other obviously factors besides money in this involved, like you know the comfort of your family, you want stability and stuff like that. But what I tell people is that yes, a house can go up, especially in the Bay Area. But I would not, I would not consider your primary home to be the real estate chunk that I specified because you're not getting anything out of it. When you're 65 years old and the property has gone from a million dollars to three million dollars, you can't do anything with that unless you sell it, right? And the 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 asset allocation portion where I specify the rental income. That's more for providing cash flow because stocks don't provide you cash flow either, right? And so, yes, especially in the Bay Area, things can appreciate, but I would really encourage you that when you're buying a home to not consider it as an investment. If it does better, it's great, but it's for the purpose of living in the house, right? That's the way I would fundamentally think about it. In terms of like options of where to, um, like how to buy or whatever, there's many like conventional Islamic mortgage uh, companies like UIF, Guidance, and Devon. Um, I have a loan with UIF myself. And there's some new, there's some partnership models, Amin Housing, which has existed in the Bay Area since 1980s. Uh, and then I'm, I'm actually associated with the new company started called NIA that's doing um, very similar to Amin Housing, but at scale uh, nationally. Uh, another thing which I really recommend to people, I only have a couple more slides, then I'll show you guys the um, one pager and then we can have questions. The other thing I really recommend to people is to not wait on uh, estate planning. So the best thing to do is to create a living trust. It probably costs like maybe like $5,000. There's a few like attorneys in the Bay Area that can do it for you. And basically what you do is whatever assets that you have, you put it in the living trust. That way that if you, die, you don't have, to, your family doesn't basically have to go to probate court and deal with all that stuff. They just, everything, all your assets basically live in the living trust and what's distrib how it's distributed is basically defined in the will, right? Um, and you need to be very careful here because the Islamic rules on um, the proceeds of state are generally like very, very strict. Like you have maybe about 20 to 30% of optionality of what you can choose from, everything else is pretty much set in stone. 
of, of how it should be basically distributed. Uh, okay, so quick point on charity and zakat. Like a lot of us, I'm sure, work in tech. And the problem is that you might be, be compensated by um, your salary, you might, part of your salary you might be compensated by your company's stock price. And what ends up happening is that people have like, I don't know, let's say you work at Amazon, you end up having, that's like your largest stock portfolio position. And then what happens is that you have too much of that, you're, you're not diversified and you have too much like Amazon stock versus any of your other stocks. So then people always get into this dilemma of like, well, what should I do? Should I sell the Amazon stock and I'll have to pay gains on it and stuff like that? The easiest thing I recommend people to do is use something called like a donor advised fund. It just makes the process super easy to be able to donate things besides cash, like stocks, crypto, whatever that you want. So what I recommend to people is like, you, if you have an over concentrated of a particular position, whether it's like Bitcoin or a particular stock, the way to um, decrease that position, one way would be to sell, realize those gains, right? The second way is to donate some of those stocks instead of cash. So what I basically do is like, if I have a concentrated position of something, um, I will donate a few, a few shares to Charity Vest. It's, Charity Vest is a company, it's like a donor advised fund. They do it for free. Um, I, donated, I, I, I donated to cha uh, Charity Vest, and then whenever I want, I have basically a monthly schedule basically that I send to a few charities, right? Or if I don't want to follow a monthly schedule, I can just donate from that. It's, like, it's almost like a bank account. You can donate from that bank, bank account. The advantage of using like one thing, like a donor advice fund or, or charity vest, is that you get one tax receipt at the end of the year. You're not waiting on anybody to send you a receipt. So I just see that I donated like whatever, $10,000 basically every year. And they make it super streamlined with uh, stock donations as well. Unfortunately, like our community organizations are not as equipped to handle um, all the things kind of that you need from a tax basis for when you're donating stock. And so that's why I kind of recommend people to use uh, Charity Vest. So the key is, especially if you, you work in tech, you probably have a very concentrated position of your employer or your f previous employer. And the w you need to be conscious about that and the way to bring that concentration down in the most tax effective way is to basically donate that stock. That's kind of the, the summary. Um, the, there's, there's like lots of like crazy books that you can read when it comes to investing and um, the two that I really recommend are, one is called like The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel and the second one is, it's a horrible, horrible name but it's like I will teach you to be rich and this guy actually, if you don't like reading, this guy actually has a Netflix show too which is pretty good. The thing that you'll realize once you read both these books is it has very little to do with inve actual investing and it has to do with like behavioral decisions that you need, how you need to adjust your behavior when it comes to investing. Um, so that's all I had for the deck. I'm gonna show you the one pager that I have and then happy to answer questions because that's often where the most interesting stuff is. So this is the website, it's called Muslim.finance. Lot, lots of it is like a repeat of what I said but you can see like there's a section on financial, how to, like, keys to financial peace, we reviewed that, we re reviewed, like, how to save subconsciously, the keys to investing we also reviewed. Um, lots of people have questions about, like, investing in stock market, and I don't, I don't like to tell people what specifically to buy, but I generally recommend that you buy indexes or something like uh, Amana Mutual Fund. So, um, you know, you can typically buy, like, Amana Growth or Amana Income. They've done, like, I don't know, over the last 15 to 20 years, they've probably done around like 15% uh, annualized returns, which is fantastic. Um, QQQ is only like 60, so if you wanna like check whether a particular stock is compliant or not, there's a company that I'm uh, invested in called Zoya, which basically tells you on a particular stock or index like how, how compliant it is. Um, for if you're investing in an index, it has to be less than 5% of the stocks in there. Uh, have, uh, less than 5% can be non-compliant. 95% needs to be compliant. 
Um, so QQQ is like a famous like index. It's basically a tech weighted index. Tech weighted basically means that you might have heard like Apple, Amazon, Google, these are all very large companies in terms of market cap. Their market cap is in the trillions of dollars. So the larger the company, the more weight it has in the index. So, you know, Apple, I don't remember what the weight is, but Apple has like, I think like a 12% weight. Microsoft has like a 12% weight, et cetera. So the point is that the largest companies have a larger weight, basically. Um, but QQQ has, I would say, I think it's about like 70% compliant. So if you do want, I'd, I'd, it would not be compliant of you to buy that on your own. So what I, what I do is I publish annually a filter of QQQ uh, on this website that you can see. Alternatively, there's a, there's a new index or a new one that I came across, which is called XLK, which is very similar to QQQ, but it's 95% compliant, like plus or minus like 1%. So you can just buy that like in, in your brokerage account, basically. But the key thing here is that, and it depends on what type of brokerage account that you have, but the key thing that I would really, really recommend is you automate it. Just keep buying some X dollar, define, define some budget that you wanna have for your investing, and just literally keep buying it every week. That's, that's what I literally do. Um, for 401k, lots of people have questions of like what's compliant or not. I gen generally recommend the most tech-weighted index will probably be the most compliant. Um, and it generally will be the pro highest performing thing as well. If you have Fidelity, there's something called brokerage link, which basically means that you can kind of buy your own, you can choose your own investments from there. So if your company's 401k has Fidelity, there's some like instructions on the website for how to, to do that. Then you can buy like Amana or whatever you want from there. Um, I think I talked about balancing investments, we talked about a little bit 401k. There's a section a little bit on ESA, educational savings account. They are, they are tax advantage. There's a few links for kind of um, what are the options to buy a home. Uh, some Saka calculators, some, um, there's some tools where you, you don't need kind of like a lawyer and they can handle the um, estate planning for you. I haven't used any of them, but my brother used uh, Sheriovis, I think. Um, and then if you have student loans, uh, I serve on the board of a nonprofit called the Continuous Charity where we provide uh, interest-free student loans and we also refinance student loans. Um, so if you are in that position, uh, check out uh, Continuous Charity. And I think the applications are um, March, or, March or April. Um, yeah, so you can go to that guide to see more information, and um, I guess we can it'll open it up for uh, questions. Yeah, we can. Thank you so much, Brother Zafir. So I know you're a little bit sort of Zafir. Uh, very insightful talk. Maybe before uh, we jump into Q and A, you can tell us a little bit about yourself because I know you started very young investing, and what got you into the market? What keeps you inside? Sure. Um, so I was born and raised in the Bay Area. Uh, I grew up in like Saratoga, Cupertino area. Uh, I went to school at UC Irvine and then I spent uh, six and a half years at Amazon. Um, and I started in like maybe like investing since I was 16. Um, and I used to have this website called Underage Investor where I used to like analyze stocks and like publish them. Um, and then uh, since then I've been involved, uh, my father and I run a series of real estate funds called Cordoba Funds. And its newest project is called NIA, which is very similar to Amin Housing, but it's trying to take Amin Housing and uh, take it kind of nationally. So it provides a debt-free alternative to buying uh, homes. And then in addition to that, I've served on like a number of endowment boards with um, IMRC, which is Indian Muslim Relief and Charities. They have about a $35 million endowment. Um, and most recently we've started working on standardizing best practices around uh, endowments as well. So that's kind of my, my background or so. Thank you, thank you. All right, so we have a little bit of time for Q&A, inshallah. Just raise your hand, we'll do one brother, one sister, and we'll ping pong back and forth. Assalamu alaikum. Have you heard of uh, Wahid yeah. app? So what do you think about that? I just heard about it. Um, so uh, I think, so HLAL, uh, the index that I showed before, it's actually sponsored by Wahid. Um, so Wahed, they call it basically, it's called like a robo-advisor. Um, and there's like, 
non-Islamic robe. I'm sorry? Um, they use like an algorithm to base. Apex? Uh, I, that might be like the sponsor of the ETF. Um, but basically what a robo-advisor does is it just saves like, you know this, this allocation thing that I was showing you guys before? They'll, they'll basically, based off of like your age or whatever, they'll say like, if you, if you have $100 in your portfolio, they'll say like 90% goes to stocks, 10% goes to bonds. And instead of bonds, they'll invest it in Sukuk. So personally, um, and, and then if you look at this chart that I showed, they'll mostly invest in like HLAL. And HLAL has not done as well as other indexes. Uh, partly because HLAL is just like a blanket filter of all basically like s stocks and then they ju they've just taken like uh, whatever ones are compliant from there. I think you'll get better performance if you pick, if you have a tech weighted index basically and that's what XLK and QQQ are. Um, especially in like 401ks and for people that need to be a little bit more conservative on their age, Amana is honestly a great option. It's still tech weighted, but not as tech weighted as XOK and QQQ. Uh, and then within Amana, you have Amana growth and Amana income. Amana growth is even more focused on tech rather than Amana income. The Amana growth performs slightly better, but honestly, Amana income is great too. So what I sometimes recommend to people is like 50% in XOK, 25% Amana growth, 25% in Amana income. And I, I would personally not buy any of these Sukuka options. I don't think that they're like the most, it's very murky in terms of compliance and it's just not like a good investment. So it, you can pretty much achieve everything that you want to achieve without Wahid. I think they, I don't know if they have some reoccurring component. Um, that part might be useful, but otherwise you can just kind of do it yourself. Okay, sisters, let's take a question from your side. Shall I just raise your hand? I'll come to you with the mic. Mashallah, there we go. Um, if you can expand a little more on the uh, 10,000 dona uh, donation um, uh, um, LLC, I think I don't know which one you talked about, um, because I did heard that if, uh, if you're getting a lot, lot of return on any investment, if you're getting a lot of ROI on any investment, there is another way I heard that you can roll that into a nonprofit organization, like if you open a nonprofit organization, LLC, and then donate that 10,000, that way you can secure more, like you, you will not end up paying more taxes. So, but if you, if you have any information on that, if you can expand, that would be great. Yeah, so the, um it's, it's not really about um, opening like a nonprofit or LLC, but I had, um, I think, where did it go? This portion. So anytime you have a gain, right, whether it's like you sell a stock or you have some dividends basically, um, the key is that you can basically wash it off with donations. That's like the high level principle, right? Whether you have rental income or um, capital gains. And so what I recommend people to do is that if they have a concentration of a particular stock position, like you work at Amazon, for example, and you have a lot of Amazon stock because that's partly how they compensate you, to basically um, deconcentrate that by donating app Amazon stock. And Charity Vest just makes it easy to basically do that. Um, that's basically kind of the main way. Um, for most people, it's actually not going to matter because there's like a standard deduction of, I forgot what it is, I think it's like $26,000 or something like that that you get automatically off of your taxes. So typically if your donations are less than that, then this, part, this portion does not really matter as much, but it's really a way for you to just um, reduce the, like, your concentrated positions. Just raise your hand and I'll come over to you. So could you go over some of the terminology that you talked about? What's an index fund? What's a mutual fund? What's a stock fund? So a mutual fund is an actively managed basket of stocks. So you, you might have heard of like Amana mutual funds. 
that's operated by some by a company called Saturna Capital, where they're actively choosing particular stocks. An index fund is think of it as like a um, it's an it's a it's a just a certain set of the stock market, right? So QQQ is basically like the top hundred stocks in the Nasdaq um, in the Nasdaq like. Uh, I forgot what it's called, the, uh, the, the stocks that are basically listed on the NASDAQ. Then you have um, XLK, which is basically like tech companies that are in the S&P 500, right? So the, the key thing about an index is that it's automatically adjusting over time. So let's say Apple becomes from like $1 trillion to $2 trillion. So their weight in the index might increase from like 5 to 10%, for example, right? So it's, then if you buy XLK again, you're automatically getting buying 10% instead of 5%. So it's automatically kind of helping you make decisions of what to buy instead of um, you having to actively manage it, right? So best thing to do again is to buy an index or like Amana has done great and it's a great option as well. As well. Okay. Any questions? Sisters? One more thing I, I was curious about, uh, Brother Sophia, if you could talk about the conventional Islamic mortgages, like the UIF, and then how does that compare or contrast with the, the, the partnership models that you talked about, NIA and Amin Housing? Yeah, so um, I think I like to tell people that, you know, the UIF and the Devon and the Guidance, they follow, um, they, they, they follow like the legal version of the Islamic law. But substance-wise, they, they, or they could be lacking kind of in the Islamic spirit. What I mean by that is like, if you look at the principles of Islamic finance, the main principles are you have to share equally in the profit and the loss. There's no such thing as a guaranteed return, right? So if you think about who's on the other side of these mortgages, right? Most of the time they're selling to Freddie Mae, Fannie Mac, and it's basically a guaranteed return that those people get for the mortgage. That fundamentally is un-Islamic, right? No matter of what the contract is kind of on the other side. And so the core principle of Islamic finance is you can participate in the gain, but you also have to participate in the risk of a loss. And that's what the partnership model is. So um, I mean, housing is one option, and NIA is a, a company that we started basically, where it's very simple, the person Let's say you're buying a million dollar house, the person puts 20% down, 200K. Nia puts down $800,000. And we share equally in the major expenses, we share equally in the taxes, we share equally in the insurance. And you can buy additional equity at whatever the market value of the house is. So let's say it goes from a million dollars to 900K. You can buy additional equity beyond your 20% at that 900K value. Let's say the house goes to 1.1 million, you can buy additional equity in the home at 1.1 million, basically. And so it's a, it's a true partnership model because um, if the home goes down and you sell the home at a loss, we have to realize that loss as well. No bank will ever do that for you. And because of that, we have to be very conscious about where areas that we invest in. If you go to a bank and you tell them that you wanna buy in the swampland of Florida, they're not gonna stop you because they don't care they're gonna get 5% return on their investment. But as, as a partnership model with NIA or Amin Housing, they have to be very conscious about that. Right? So it's, it's fundamentally, that's where kind of thing, things break, if you will. All right, I'll be right over to you, sister. Real quickly, on, on where do they get the capital from then for uh, like conventional stock mortgages? Where are they going to get that capital? The conventional mortgages like UIF, Devon Bank, they, they sell to government sponsored entities like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Uh, UIF and Guidance have started, I think UIF only has started to come out with something called time deposit accounts which are trying to supplement their things from. But for NIA and Amin Housing, all that capital is from the community, basically, right? So that's again, the Islamic, the Islamic spirit behind it is that there's there an individual, like someone is might be paying rent or something like that, but someone else is basically benefiting from that. It's not just going into something that someone can buy at a, at a, at a guaranteed rate. Um, I want to find out, based on your 10 plus years of experience, um, and I see that you have uh, 
invested in um, indexes, you have invested in stocks, Bitcoin, real estate. So if you rate which one is the most conservative and more uh, profitable, if like from top to bottom, like can you just give us a gist of it? Yeah. So this this kind of table has a pretty good, the best returns that you're generally going to get are going to be in like a tech weighted index, right? Like the XLK or the QQQ. I put 7 to 10 percent here on average, but realistically you'll get somewhere in the range, like at least in the last 10 to 15 years it's been closer to 15 percent. So especially if you're young, that's where like you should have majority of your money. The real estate component, if it's unlevered, you're typically going to get like 6 to 9 percent on like cash flow, right? Like rental income coming in. And you know, it can be basically a small amount in the beginning, but then over time you want to um, increase your allocation towards that. Um, and then you can have some amount of alternatives like gold and crypto as well. It's basically just to hedge inflation, right? So you can buy GLD ETF, I think I mentioned that, and then or um, you can buy Bitcoin or IBIT index for, for Bitcoin and then some amount of cash. The thing to do basically is to not chase returns, it's to strategically decide whatever portion that you decide. Let's say stocks should be 80% and real estate should be 25%. Whatever it is, just make sure that you're actually abiding by those guidelines rather than someone approaches you for an opportunity or you see a stock price that's down and you want to invest in it. Um, sticking to these guidelines will solve 99% of the kind of your investment performance, if you will. Question from brother here. Um, I was wondering um, on 401ks that have only certain investment options, uh, what do you recommend? Um, so for for you know since they're not compliant. Yeah. So oftentimes you can what you want to definitely stay away from is the target funds because they'll often have some bond component in them. You want to look for like generally the ones that have are tech weighted. So sometimes depending on the 401k you might be able to see that. The tech weighted ones will generally be the most compliant option. Now there's different like rules around this. I'm, I'm not the right person to get into like whether you can invest in it or not. But now Zoya, um, it's an app that you can look up. It has things at an index level. So it can tell you if like from an index perspective whether it's 60% or 90% compliant. The general rule is that you need to be around 95% compliance, basically. Um, that's what I was recommend. And then if you have Fidelity, then you can explore something called Brokerage Link. That will allow you to actually customize and choose which investments that you have. Um, those, are the, those are kind of like the two options. Um, and if it's not as compliant, then um, you, know, you, can, you can still open up like an IRA account, for example, and other things like that to, to use that potentially. Also, a big advantage is if you are under um, one—I don't remember the exact number. I think it's 160k. You can invest in something called a Roth IRA account, which is you're putting post-tax dollars into that account, and then all of your gains are tax-free. Versus in a traditional 401k, you're putting pre-tax dollars, and then you have to pay basically on the gains. So, especially when you're young, if you can put like five, ten thousand dollars there and then just let it grow over the course of 30, 40 years, it'll be, you'll be at a huge advantage. Assalamu okay. alaikum. Quick question. I was wondering, um, do you have any advice if somebody is um, just a regular W-2 earner and wants to lower their tax liability? Usually most people rely on their mortgage with interest and all that and writing that off. But like if you're trying to avoid that route, what are some other ways that just a W-2 earner can lower their tax liability besides investing 401k? There's like not any much. Any creative ways? <laughs> There's not much um, donating, but then you have, you have a standard write-off of 24000 Some people, they... Um, uh, this is not exactly writing off your W-2 income, but like if you invest in real estate, there's something called depreciation, which basically means that if you get, if you buy a house and, you're gener and you, that house like, I don't know, gives you $5,000 of income, 
you can have a paper tax expense which actually lowers that actual income that you have to pay taxes on. And that's called depreciation. But you have to realize it at the end when you sell it. But lots of people buy real estate because of kind of that reason where you don't have to pay taxes on all of the income that you're getting. So that's one potential option. Uh, other than that, um, unfortunately, though, it's, not, it's very difficult to do in, in reality. Okay. As a, a business owner with a, a few employees, let's say two to seven or eight employees, it's a corporation, but you still get a W-2, and you want to invest in a minor mutual fund. So what is the option or the advice you would give to use as an investment as an individual or use an investment, um, you know, paying from the corporation pre-tax or post-tax? What is the best way? Yeah, there's, there's pretty, um, it depends what type of uh, retirement plan you, you've set up, but the problem with doing it from a corporation perspective is that um, there's certain rules that you can't just do it for one employee and not for others. It just, it depends on the retirement plan. So the better, the better thing to do is um, have like a W-2 uh, plan and have some retirement portion there and then just use the, sometimes you can open up something called like a SEP IRA, which can be independent and then you can put um, more, more money into there. People also do other things like they'll, you can contribute post-tax dollars into a, into a IRA and then they'll roll that into something called like a mega backdoor Roth IRA, for example. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I would recommend. Like you can, just because um, you can't invest in like a retirement account or put more, I would say just don't let that stop you from investing, right? Because whether you, it's not really tax free. You're just gonna pay taxes on that at the end. You're just postponing the taxes rather than doing it now. Okay, we have some uh, viewers online that they're asking about uh, college savings for their kids. What's the best way to get um, college savings going for your young kids? So there's something called the ESA account. If you're under, um, I think, 216K, there's a section on this uh, on here. Yeah, if you're under 220K, you can qualify for putting $2,000 down. And uh, I think Amana has an option for an ESA account. Otherwise, if you're above that, there's not really a lot of options. The best thing to do is create a custodial account and then uh, use that. Okay. Any questions? We have questions online. We can take those. Okay. We'll take some online questions. Uh, what do you think about buying gold, Bitcoin, and ETFs? And what is ETFs? ETFs is exchange traded funds. Again, it's like an index. Basically, it's the same thing. Uh, gold and Bitcoin, I would use as a hedge. We need it less here in the U.S. because we don't have that much inflation risk compared to other countries. But I would put like, you know, between one and 5% of my portfolio to something like uh, gold or, or Bitcoin. Got it. For the average investor who's new to all this, uh, do you recommend it a individual stocks or do a brokerage account like with Vanguard? Uh, I recommend creating a brokerage account where wherever you bank. So if you use Bank of America, they have Merrill Edge, Chase now, they have brokerage accounts as well. And if you're new, just buy Amana or buy like an index fund. That's the simplest thing to basically do and it will be the best performing thing too. Okay. Jazakallah. We're pushing against uh, Isha Per. May Allah bless you. If you have any questions for Brother Safir, can you stick around? Inshallah. You can stick around. We'll do Azan now. May Allah bless you. Thank you for the work you do. And please check out Muslim.finance and you can also get a hold of Brother Safir at that link. Jazakallah.